much fun as we did last night at the brewery. It was very nice, very interesting actually, to see the, um, the equipment for making the, the beer there. It was beautiful equipment. It's copper and tin and all. It's really very pretty. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. So it looks like there may be less interest this morning in tumors, I don't know. <laughs> or maybe it's just us. Yeah, it's, it is, it is, it is, that's right. <laughs> so we're going to uh, go ahead and get started and talk about cardiac tumors this morning. This is really a, an uncommon problem. We don't, we don't see many tumors in, in childhood, fortunately. Uh, if you look at published series or our own series, it's uh, about 0.025% of 11,000 autopsies had, um, uh, had tumors. And most of these present early in life, in the first year or even in utero. A number of uh, tumors are diagnosed in utero, particularly rhabdomyomas. Um, and that is the most common type of tumor that we see in children is a rhabdomyoma. And this is often associated with tuberous sclerosis, um, which is a TSC1 or TSC2 genes. There are two genes now that are known to be associated with uh, tuberous sclerosis and that can be associated with this particular tumor type. Um, these seem to be tumor suppressor genes, at least part of the function for all of the genes that we'll talk about today that cause cardiac tumors or that are associated with cardiac tumors have a tumor suppressor effect. The the, probably the major characteristic of tuber sclerosis tumors is that they're multiple most of the time. They aren't always. They can be single, but most of them are multiple. They can mostly involve the ventricles, but can involve virtually any chamber. It can occur in the atria uh, or the ventricles. And the curious thing about them is that they often regress. Uh, probably most of them uh, end up regressing, particularly the ones diagnosed early in utero. And this is um, what the tumor cell type looks like. You can see myocytes around the edge here, but the uh, main tumor cells are rather large oval cells, and they're clear here on this preparation because they're filled with glycogen. Uh, and glycogen tends to go away on standard uh, histological preparations. You'd have to do a special stain here to show the glycogen, but that's what's in these. These are often called spider cells or stellate cells uh, because of the, the glycogen content and what they look like. <clears throat> and as I said, about 30 to 50 percent of these are associated with tuber sclerosis, and you can see uh, tubers here uh, in the brain around the, the uh, ventricles, these little tumors here uh, that are characteristic of this. These don't appear until probably at least 6 to 12 months. So uh, if you're screening for this using brain MRI, it's probably better not to try to do it too early uh, in the first year because you'll miss it. Uh, these don't really appear until a little bit later, so you want to wait till six months to a year, probably closer to a year, to really uh, be able to detect them with high reliability. And here's what uh, these tumors look like. Here we're looking uh, inside the right atrium. Here you see the appendage here. Uh, and there's uh, a little mass over here. And then we can look down into to the ventricle. There you can see this little uh, mass over here in the atrium. And we're looking down into the ventricle. When we open the ventricle here, you'll see that there is a, a mass up here on the interventricular septum near the outflow tract. There's another one up here on the free wall. You can see the difference in the character of this little tumor versus the myocardium. Here's a large mass uh, here within the atrial septum. It's a little 
lighter color compared to the myocardium around it. The outflow tract in this case is not obstructed. And here you can see this mass in the septum that's been cut uh, into two pieces. Uh, it's, they're usually quite uh, cap encapsulated like this. Uh, they're uh, discrete tumors. You can see a nice edge on them usually. There's another one uh, over here. Here's the other edge, the left ventricular uh, surface here. There's another one on the left ventricular free wall back here, another one here, and then the <clears throat> anterior papillary muscle here is involved in tumor as well. So these things can really be anywhere. And here you can see a couple of little excrescences on this one on the septum. And when you close the ventricle in this one, you can see how that obstructs the left ventricular outflow tract and was almost surely the cause of demise of this baby. This, this baby died uh, as a neonate. So you can see how this uh, can cause obstruction. Here's another one on the external surface of the left AV junction. Here you can see the atrial appendage. Here the left atrial appendage. So this is sort of straddling uh, the AV junction. And these can be associated with pre-excitation uh, and arrhythmias uh, when they're, particularly when they're in, uh, in that kind of position. <clears throat> the next most common tumor that we see is a, a fibroma. Uh, these are usually quite large and solitary. They, typically involve the interventricular septum or the left ventricular free wall, although they don't always. You can see them in the right ventricle as well. I'll show you one of those. These uh, tend to grow and don't have a very good blood supply, so um, parts of the tumor become necrotic and then calcify, uh, and they're rather heterogeneous uh, in appearance. Uh, these are often associated with ventricular arrhythmias. This is how they often present uh, is with uh, um, premature ventricular beats or even uh, ventricular tachycardia or sudden death or aborted sudden death. Um, sometimes they show up because they cause a bizarre appearance of the heart on chest x-ray and a child gets a chest x-ray for a cold or pneumonia or whatever reason pediatricians do chest x-rays uh, and there's the thing on the funny heart border and, and then an echocardiogram shows the tumor. Fibromas can be associated with Gorlin syndrome. Uh, Gorlin syndrome is a <clears throat> multiple tumor syndrome that often involves a dermoid nevus, basal cell nevus, uh, as well as medulloblastoma, uh, which is the usual cause of death in, in Gorlin syndrome. Medulloblastomas are pretty bad actors. Um, <clears throat> and it's associated with PTCH1, which is a, a known tumor suppressor gene, and when it's mutated, uh, that's why these patients get multiple malignant tumors. Um, Gorlin syndrome accounts for only a very small part of uh, fibromas that you see. Most patients don't have this, but can be uh, part of the syndrome. Histologically, what we see is a lot of collagen. This is all collagen here, worlds of collagen, collagen bundles. And then over here, this is a trichrome stain so that the red here shows uh, myocardium. And you can see that the myocardium is partly entrapped by the fibrous tissue. Blue here is, is collagen and fibrous tissue. So you have variations in the appearance of this with myocytes being trapped and, and included uh, within the fibrous tissue. But most of it looks like this. It's not very cellular uh, and mostly just a collagen ground substance with... Um, Here's uh, what these tumors look like. Here's a, obviously a, a very large uh, uh, appearing heart. Here's the right atrium back here. Tricuspid valve here. Here you can see the foramen, coronary sinus back here in the right atrium. Atrial appendage up here. And then when we open it, you'll see here's the right ventricle, tricuspid valve, septal leaflet there, anterior leaflet up here. And then when we open it and look at the septum, you'll see that this is all the tumor here within the interventricular septum. Uh, it really takes up virtually all of the interventricular septum here. And you can see how inhomogeneous it is. You see streaks and areas of calcification and areas of, uh, of necrosis within the, the tumor. And here's the, the apical part of it over here. When we bring this back up, you'll see that 
On the other side uh, is the left ventricular chamber here. Uh, there's the left ventricular free wall out here, and this is all the interventricular surface, which is bowed into the left ventricle because of this huge tumor uh, within the interventricular septum. Here's left atrium back here, and outflow tract is up here. Here's another one. You can see this is the tumor down here uh, the, on the inferior anterior surface. There you can see this huge tumor there. Here's the right atrium in this patient. Right atrium, the appendage up here, the foramen ovale, coronary sinus. Here's the tricuspid valve here, down into the body of the right ventricle. And notice that this tumor is sort of hanging off of the, the right ventricle. The left ventricle is over here. Here's the anterior mitral leaflet, the left ventricular outflow tract. All of that's fine and looks pretty normal. But when we turn this uh, back around to look at the apex, there's the left ventricular outflow tract there. You can see from the apex how this tumor sort of hangs off the anterior wall of the right ventricle here. It makes up most of the right ventricular anterior wall. Uh, this is the interventricular septum. Here's the uh, anterior interventricular groove with the anterior descending artery there. So this is all part of the right ventricular free wall. It's a little bit of an unusual location for fibromas, but as I say, they really can occur uh, almost anywhere, even though most of the time they're in the septum or the LV free wall. So these things are huge, uh, and you can see the cut surface here. Again, uh, it's uh, sort of irregular bundles of, uh, of collagen hypocellular uh, kind of tumor. So those are really the two by far most common tumors that we see in childhood. Everything else is really pretty uncommon. Uh, myxomas occur uh, in childhood. They're, they're rare uh, in children. Um, usually arise from the fossovalis uh, or right atrium, or they can arise, I'll show you one, coming from the mitral valve, actually, from the mitral valve apparatus itself. So they can, they can be uh, a lot of places, even though the fossa probably is the most frequent. Uh, these can obstruct inflow, and the one I'll show you was certainly doing that. Um, <clears throat> they can metastasize. They, uh, they're sort of a lobulated tumor that can have little fronds on the surface, and pieces of it can break off and go places. Uh, and they also, this can then cause a myxoma syndrome, uh, which is, is characterized by recurrent fevers and uh, evidence of uh, inflammation with um, elevated things like uh, sedimentation rate or C-reactive protein or, or these kind of things. Uh, and this is associated with Kearney complex, used to be called LAM syndrome or NAME syndrome, uh, but now it's called Kearney complex, and it's... Um, it's due to a mutation of a protein kinase A regulatory subunit um, <clears throat> that seems to, to regulate the activity of protein kinase A in many cell types. And this also seems to serve a tumor suppressor function. It seems to regulate protein kinase A and, and uh, uh, seems to be important for preventing uh, tumors. Carney complexes associated with atrial myxomas with lentigines, little uh, marks, dark marks on the skin, uh, like dark freckles, uh, and also endocrine adenomas. So there are multiple tumors uh, that can be associated with this syndrome, too. Yeah, certainly not all atrial myxomas are associated with this, but many of them are. And what we see on the cell type here, there's a, the background substance here is uh, proteoglycans and collagen and uh, sort of a myxoid, just a general proteinaceous background material that you see here. And then there are little whirls of cells, ring, ring cells that form, and then little trabeculations form, uh, linear structures form from the myxoma cells within the, uh, the tumor. These are quite characteristic features of the uh, histology of myxomas. But mostly you see this ground substance in the back that's proteoglycans and collagen elastin fibers and things like that. Here's an example of a myxoma uh, in a uh, neonate that died suddenly. Here you see the right atrium, the foramen here, and then here's the right side of the heart, 
tricuspid valve, and now we'll move over and see the tumor here, right here, uh, that's right in the mitral apparatus. It's right in the mitral valve here. There you can see mitral leaflet behind it. This is left atrium up here, left ventricle down here, and you see the lobulated uh, surface of this tumor, uh, which is quite characteristic. Here we see the, it's right in the inflow. This is the uh, part of the mitral apparatus here. And there you can see on the cut surface, it, there's often a cortex and a, um, um, an inner part of, of these tumors. You can see there's clear differentiation. It comes right out of the AV groove here um, and comes right up, uh, right in the mitral apparatus. And this appeared to be uh, obstructing uh, the mitral valve. And that's, that's what they can do. Sometimes they're pedunculated and mobile. Sometimes they're more fixed, uh, like this one. Um, and there you can see a little bit of mitral valve leaflet that seems to be incorporated into the base of the tumor. And you see the lobulations on the surface of it. And some of these little things can break off and, and go places. There are other much less common types of tumors that you see in children, intrapericardial teratomas. Uh, we certainly see that can be associated with recurrent pericardial effusion, for example. Lipomas are usually benign, really not uh, anything of interest other than that they may be confusing. Hemangiomas can certainly occur, particularly in the right atrium uh, or even in the left atrium, and these can be quite large and, and uh, uh, can um, cause uh, some overflow uh, because they're a, a, a vascular tumor. And then there are rare uh, malignant tumors. Rhabdomyosarcoma uh, is probably the most frequent malignant tumor. And then there are other tumors like Wilms or renal cell carcinoma or things like that that can actually invade up through, or hepatoblastoma, up through the inferior vena cava. Uh, and they're not primary tumors of the heart, but can actually invade uh, into the right atrium. So that's uh, about it for tumors. The interesting thing is that most of these, if, if they're syndrome associated, uh, are associated with, with the mutations of tumor suppressor cells, uh, or genes rather. Here you are. I'm gonna take off and I'll be back. Just throw it away. Can we close this blind a little bit? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um. Good morning. I think uh, it's quite interesting that we're actually running ahead of time here. We want to regard this as a, a unique experience. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about clinical uh, presentation of, of tumors. Um, I've allotted myself 20 minutes, uh, 30 minutes. So most of the tumors that uh, you see, as uh, Dr. Um, Sanders had mentioned, are, are benign on uh, the um, left are the data from the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in Washington, showing the incidence and frequency of the various tumors. And on the right, a study from uh, uh, Ton Becker, uh, published in Pediatric Cardiology. So basically, malignant tumors are very rare, uh, but uh, they, and here's, here's another series of, of patients that is published, it shows more or less the same things, and. Uh, you, you can't but open the literature any day without somebody reporting another kind of cardiac, rare cardiac tumor that's never been seen before. But uh, as Steve said, the most common are rhabdomyomas, uh, and uh, especially in infancy and in the fetus, and 90% uh, of them uh, occur 
with this in association with tuberosclerosis. And the rule of thumb is, if you find more than one rhabdomyoma, you're usually dealing with the tuberosclerosis. Um, they have a predilection for the ventricles, but they can occur everywhere. And uh, Dr. Sen has showed some beautiful examples of little rhabdomyomas on the surface. And many years ago, uh, malignant ventricular arrhythmias in childhood were published, which showed these little rhabdomyomas on the surface of the myocardium. And there was a surgeon in Houston who used to go in and remove these little things and diminish the uh, frequency of uh, um, ventricular arrhythmias. They can be associated in the fetus with high drops and present with fetal arrhythmias, including heart block. And they, uh, they, most of these benign tumors cause problems either by obstructing uh, ventricular inflow or outflow filling or by arrhythmias. Um, as you've seen, they occur... Um, um, what did I, I have to say here? I've forgotten. Uh, they, they occur all, all over in the myocardium and they're composed largely of these so-called owl eye cells with a nearly clear cytoplasm. Uh, so I have to take you back a little bit because we're now looking at these tumors in the fetus and here are some tumors uh, that we found in the fetus. This is a study from Lindsay Allen and you can see that there are a number of these uh, tumors present in an 18-week fetus. Here is another 18-week fetus uh, with multiple rhabdomyomas uh, present uh, uh, on autopsy. And this is the echocardiogram which was sent to me on the internet. And um, they were concerned about this large tumor. And my concern was that this was rhabdomyoma, uh, tuberosclerosis because if you look in here, you'll also see some small tumors uh, in, in the rest of the myocardium. And so... Um, indeed, this is the autopsy specimen, uh, the mother elected termination of pregnancy, and you can see uh, several uh, rhabdomyomas within the, uh, the myocardium here. Now, these things can present early and they can be solitary. Uh, this is a patient who presented at, uh, as a twin, twin pregnancy with uh, a, a, a monozygotic twin pregnancy, and one of the fetuses had this uh, small uh, 2.6 millimeter tumor in uh, the ventricle. And uh, we followed the pregnancy at 33 weeks. The mother was admitted with preeclampsia and both of the fetuses had multiple rhabdomyomas. And contrary to what Dr. Sanders had mentioned, uh, now, and I don't see Dr. Uh, Hasbani here yet, uh, but you can now look at uh, magnetic resonance imaging even in the fetus and detect these subependymal uh, myomas even in the fetus. And you know the, the term tuberose means potato-like and I think uh, the one uh, example that Dr. Sanders showed was a beautiful example of something that looked like a nice kartoffel, I thought, from uh, uh, what I had at lunch the other day. So they can cause conduction abnormalities, they can cause complete heart block. Uh, the, these are all fetal echocardiograms, and here's the neonate, and you can see that they grow. Now, these tumors, interestingly enough, seem to be under hormonal control in pregnancy and are large, and over the course of time, they tend to regress in their size. They don't disappear, and uh, the, the tumors are interesting in terms of the fact that they present early in the heart, and if they don't cause problems, they generally don't cause problems except for arrhythmias, which all tumors seem to have a predilection for causing. But the, the serious problems that occur with tuberous sclerosis do not occur uh, from, uh, from cardiac. Uh, they occur from renal, from hepatic, and from uh, cerebral. And um, I, I was present at the Northern California Tuberous Sclerosis Society to show them that these fetal uh, examples can be recognized. And many of the patients came to me, had this butterfly tuberose rash, and they were all very intelligent. And I think that one of the things that has changed in terms of uh, talking about intellectual 
malfunction uh, in this condition relates to the fact that these children used to have salam seizures and these seizures became uh, were uh, very um, uh, caused uh, cerebral hypoxemia and ischemia and that was the reason why they have intellectual impairment and now with a better control of uh, of seizures this is not generally the problem that doesn't mean they don't have other problems but the intellectual impairment is uh, much less frequently seen than it used to be seen. Now, here's an example of a uh, rhabdomyoma uh, that uh, was so large that it completely filled the entire right ventricle. Not only did it fill the right ventricle, but it grow, grew on both sides of the tricuspid valve and obstructed right ventricular outflow tract. So this child actually presented as a neonate, had not had fetal uh, ultrasound studies, with um, a, a pattern consistent with the cyanotic congenital heart disease. And uh, we, um, uh, we were trying to take this child to the catheterization laboratory, but it died. And what I, I don't have here, unfortunately, but I think you can see them, there are a number of small additional rhabdomyomas on the surface of this heart. And uh, uh, this was a mother who was a twin, and uh, uh, the other uh, twin had also had uh, babies without problems, and uh, they got uh, all the workup for the um, for genetic workup, and both mothers were negative. And so there is a spontaneous mutation rate that occurs in this condition that uh, makes it concerning. So uh, they can kill from other reasons. This is a fetal example of uh, the characteristic ILR cell circle there, and a nice cartoon showing this here. And this fetus, as you can see, had a very large, solitary, uh, apical left ventricular rhabdomyoma. This is the left ventricular cavity. Here's the right ventricular cavity. And the fetus died with a hemopericardium. And what had happened is you can see the left anterior descending running over here. But the, uh, in the pericardium, the tumor rubbed up and down against the the visceral and parietal pericardium and eventually eroded through the coronary artery and the fetus died from tamponade. And here's an example of an apical rhabdomyoma at the time of surgery. So a lot of the stuff that we see are rhabdomyomas. Uh, here's one obstructing the right ventricular outflow tract, again presenting as cyanotic congenital heart disease and this tumor was debulked uh, substantially by the surgeon, not uh, excluded entirely, uh, and the patient did extremely well. And of course, uh, the uh, uh, urging conservative treatment if there's no obstruction is probably the best advice that one can give for these tumors because they do tend to regress as time goes by. And as you can see, again, they multiple. You can see in the left ventricle the outflow tumor, a secondary tumor here, tumors in the apex, and tumor even within the right atrium, and they've even been seen on the Eustachian valve. And as I say, they cause obstruction, or they uh, in, in lie, lie in the ventricular septum, uh, uh, very large uh, tumors, and uh, if they don't cause obstruction, they tend to get smaller, and we don't tend to worry about them. Even a tumor like this, which seems to be occupying the entire left ventricle, had good inflow and outflow uh, without obstruction and was managed conservatively uh, and uh, did very well from the cardiac point of view. Now, just to remember that uh, this is one of the aggressive phacomas. Uh, that phacoma is a skin tumor which has uh, uh, other lesions. And you can see here with the Woods lamp, the so-called fern uh, leaf uh, that is uh, characteristic of the skin findings uh, in these multiple tumors. And the most important thing is over time they tend to regress. So um, here you can see in an adult uh, size specimen only uh, a limited number of rhabdomyomas lying uh, within the ventricles, both the right and the left ventricle. Uh, as far as, uh, Girish, are you talking on this at all? Okay, well, I'll just show you that we managed to also do a 3D study on this patient, and I think it gives you a very nice example of how the tumor can fill the ventricle. 
All right. Well, cardiac myxomas, uh, as uh, Steve said, are rare. They're associated with Carney syndrome, uh, and uh, they occur without Carney syndrome too. But uh, this is one that uh, presented to our institution with the symptoms uh, merely of malaise, uh, and this was at 4 o'clock, and this was at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, the same afternoon. Uh, here's the whole tumor uh, that you can see, and you can see how it prolapsed through the mitral valve, and this is the histology. You see a largely an acellular type of a tumor with uh, uh, um, um, nests of uh, hematoma uh, within the tumor. And so it lies within the left atrium and prolapses, usually arises off the atrial septal surface. And I think that's one of the important points about uh, the tumor is that it arises on the atrial septal surface. Now, here's a patient with Carney syndrome. Uh, and uh, this was uh, at the time that this ch child uh, uh, came to see us, had a simply uh, this large right atrial to right ventricular uh, myxoma arising off the uh, ventricular septum. And uh, it was excised, but uh, later on in life uh, it came back here again. Uh, this is the second go around, and now oh, not only is it in the right atrium and the right ventricle, but you can see it on the left side of the heart as well. There are multiple um, uh, tumors here. And this is uh, the surgical removal of these tumors. And as the surgeon said, when he uh, removed them, uh, he said, the patient will be back. So let me just move this on because uh, it gets uh, kind of repetitive in terms of taking tumors out. And here he just uh, excising the last series of tumors. And this is uh, what was uh, taken out uh, at this go round. Uh, unfortunately, this child has come back for a next go round and also has um, uh, recurrences of the tumors. And uh, uh, Stephen has talked a little bit about uh, these, um, these uh, tumors. Uh, and uh, they, they certainly uh, cause a substantial amount of problems and they have other tumors as well in skin lesions uh, like this uh, that can be seen as well as the lentigenosis. Uh, myxomas can occur not only uh, in, the, in the atrium where they usually occur, but as this report uh, from Dr. Uh, Christina Basso uh, from Padua shows, they can occur arising off the papri muscles within the left ventricle as well. Now, fibromas are the next commonest. The one thing I didn't emphasize about the tuberosclerosis and the myxoma is that they have fairly characteristic ultrasound appearances. Now, I don't say that ultrasound is an excellent test for looking at tissue characterization. It's not, and certainly MRI does an, a much better job at that. But I think that you can usually recognize from the character of the myxoma and the, or the rhabdomyoma what you're dealing with. And similarly, I think you can do that also with fibromas as well. And uh, these the lesions occur almost everywhere. Stephen has shown you some pictures. Here are uh, pictures by a gross uh, anatomy and also by cartoons as well as uh, uh, within the ventricle. And many of these patients that have got these tumors uh, uh, have had multiple attempts at enucleation by surgeons. The problem with these tumors is not only do they just lie within the ventricle, but they also invade around the coronary arteries. And so it can sometimes very difficult to call these tumors out. And uh, so uh, many of these patients then become candidates for heart transplantation. And we've done a number of those. This is a young patient that came to see us um, uh, with a uh, upper respiratory infection. And in the course of the upper respiratory infection, he had a chest x-ray which showed cardiomegaly. And so anybody that gets cardiomegaly gets an echocardiogram. And this is what we found on the echocardiogram there. A large tumor seen within the uh, right AV junction. Uh, and um, the surgeon went in, uh, removed uh, the tricuspid valve, enucleated the tumor, put the tricuspid valve together with no... Uh, um, uh, untoward result and the patient was discharged. The mother was extremely angry that the kid had a thoracotomy when all he did was come in with an upper respiratory infection. But at least we got rid of this. He's never had a recurrence and continues to do well. 
Unfortunately, that's not always the case in fibromas. And one of the tragedies we see in tumors that make it such a worry is that the patients become prone to arrhythmias. And when the patients are prone to arrhythmias, uh, then they get um, uh, um, malignant ventricular arrhythmias. As you see, uh, this patient has a large tumor and uh, became a completely um, uh, neurologically compromised by this uh, tumor, and so no, nothing further was, was done by it. Here is another example of a similar situation from a large tumor, which looks like it's uh, resectable, a fibroma. Notice within the fibroma this alternating bright and dark echo, which usually represents the fibrous stroma within the cellular uh, uh, area of the tumor. So I think that we can uh, make some kind of an assessment that this clearly is not a rhabdomyoma because of this uh, varied uh, concentration of the, um, uh, the brightness uh, within uh, this myocardial tumor. And uh, not only is it associated with Gorlin syndrome, but with many other syndromes like this Gardner syndrome, which is a dominant inheritance syndrome with intestinal polyps, osteomas, fibromas, and epidermal cysts. And I'm sure that Dr. Sanders would have a slide that would show that there's a tumor suppressor gene, which is uh, not um, uh, operative in these patients. Now, the next commonest tumor in my experience, and we've had a lot of nasty experience with this, is pericardial teratomas. And pericardial teratomas largely present because people recognize this in uterine life from the pattern of high drops, which develops in association with these tumors. Okay? And they, um, they actually secrete a lot of fluid, and uh, they, they certainly cause a lot of uh, significant problems. Uh, on magnetic resonance imaging, they're fairly characteristic in their pre presentation. Here's a patient that we followed from uh, in utero in life with a large teratoma to birth, and uh, with uh, the treatment of these tumors in utero is to uh, try and uh, do pericardiocentesis, which uh, the perinatologists can do, and sometimes it uh, allows uh, enough time that the fetus can get to be mature. These tumors usually arise off the anterior aspect of the vascular structure, and they come away very easily according to the surgeries. Not a whole lot of, 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 of cutting and slicing to be done. Here's a magnetic resonance image, and at birth this patient was taken immediately to the operating room, a thoracotomy done, and the tumor removed. Here are a whole series of tumors that we've come across associated with the, uh, uh, the pericardial teratoma. Oh dear. I've got batteries all over the floor. I won't be using it anyway. So, um, as you can see here, this tumor indents the right atrial surface. And there's a tremendous amount of uh, pericardial fluid and as well as high drops so that there's pleural fluid and skin edema, which you can see over here associated with these tumors. And these are not all the same patient. They're all different patients. So you can see here a large pleural effusion, a small pericardial effusion, and so on and so forth. And uh, you can look at them all over. They have, again, this characteristic cystic nature lying uh, within the tumors that is easily identifiable and certainly not a rhabdomyoma. Uh, this uh, first patient actually underwent in utero treatment. And uh, so the patient was exteriorized, the fetus was exteriorized, and very rapidly the tumor was removed. Unfortunately, as I showed you, the atrium indented. This patient had high drops. Uh, the tumor was successfully removed. Uh, but the mother then went on, was discharged out of the hospital, still maintaining the pregnancy at 27 weeks, but uh, be developed uh, a, a condition associated with a thickened placenta called the mirror syndrome, where the placenta starts to act as an autologous endocrine organ, produced thyrotropic hormone, and the mother had a thyroid storm, which would have killed her, and so they um, delivered the baby, uh, the baby had severe respiratory distress syndrome at 28 weeks of life and, and succumbed. But I think it is possible under 
uh, ideal circumstances to consider uh, surgery. And if you're interested in reading the paper, here I know one of the authors uh, on this paper, fetal diagnosis uh, in 2002. So uh, cardiac lipoma, this is a patient uh, that was written up by Mark Friedberg, whose name is appropriately spelled here, um, and uh, was a 13-year-old boy who collapsed at home, uh, probably with an arrhythmia, and uh, he had this large encapsulated mass. Uh, it's, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you what the histology is based on this. We didn't do MRI. Uh, here's the TEE showing this lying in the lateral AV groove. Yeah, did MRI. You did? It, it looked like a lipoma on MRI. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, you can look for fat on it. I'm, I'm sure when Karen comes, if she comes, she'll uh, talk to us about that. And here is the, the surgery, and you look as you open the uh, lateral aspect of the myocardium. Uh, this really is a fatty tumor, uh, histologically uh, proven to be a lipoma. Now, although these are not really cardiac tumors, mediastinal teratomas are common presentation. They give rise to high drops, uh, a bigger part, or pericardial and pleural effusions. And you can see here, again, a large mass encroaching on the heart, uh, which um, gives rise to um, obstruction and uh, are, are best removed. Uh, other tumors are rare. Uh, hemangiomas, we've identified mesotheliomas. I haven't really seen. I have patients that have had Purkinje tumors, and, uh, and then there's uh, fibroelastomas. Now, uh, everybody's got these rare tumors. This is called an inflammatory myoblastic tumor presented at three months of age with a progressively increasing mass within the, uh, the atrium, the right atrium here, almost filling the right atrium. We actually, our working diagnosis on this patient was a myxoma, but it turned out to be a... Um, a inflammatory myoblastic tumor, and you can see here that it is actually arising off a pedicle here on the right ventricular uh, wall, and uh, again, uh, at surgery, uh, was easily um, resectable, and uh, after um, the removal, only a minimal degree of tricuspid regurgitation was present, and there's been no recurrence of this tumor as well. Now, papillary fibroelastomas are a problem. Here's what the histology looks like of a papillary fibroelastoma. They're excrescent. They're dangerous because they can embolize. And here is an example taken from the New England Journal of Medicine of an isolated papillary fibroelastoma which an, um, in, um, uh, obturated the left coronary orifice and caused sudden death here. And uh, we've seen this occur also with the inflammatory myoblastic tumors. So um, certainly uh, when you see these pedunculated uh, tumors that look like this, it's certainly an indication to do anything on them. Now we talked about malignant tumors. Here's a Wilms tumor. Uh, and uh, they do the same as the renal uh, tumors do. They invade up the inferior vena cava and into the heart. Uh, this is a patient that has... Um, a, uh, um, such a mass, underwent a successful chemotherapy and then resection without any evidence of e embolization. Other primary malignant tumors are rare. Uh, this is a sarcoma reported from, uh, from uh, Philadelphia by Dov McElhinney when he uh, was working there as a fellow. And the other tumors that we see are the metastatic tumors uh, from uh, osteosarcomas and Ewing sarcomas. And here's a tumor that has metastasized uh, up the inferior vena cava and into the right ventricle and is obstructing uh, almost the entire right ventricle and the patient died within a week of this echocardiogram being recorded. Okay. Uh, in, uh, some, some patients may have tumors that uh, similarly will metastasize from the pulmonary veins into the, the left side of the heart and here is a malignant lung tumor doing the same. And uh, we've talked about the extracardiac tumors. So here's really the bottom line on this tumors. Is tumors are very easy when you know that it's a tumor. But what is this? This is a patient who had a new mass present on the mitral valve. Um, but you need to have some history because this patient had, in fact, um, uh, uh, had some mitral valve surgery for a rheumatic disease 
and then presented with this. And we didn't know what it was. They did take the child back to tumor and found out that this was a new thrombus that had developed. So I think that that's always the important issue in terms of looking at tumors is that um, you have to always consider thrombi. And here's a patient that has a funny mass on the left ventricular aspect of the septum. And again here, um, as Sir William Osler said, there are only three important things in medicine, and that's the history, the history, and the history. This patient had a previous cardiopulmonary bypass and had a, what they call a vent put on uh, to suck the air out of the left side of the heart, and it had encroached on the septum and traumatized the septum, caused a hematoma, which has subsequently become organized. And this isn't the same patient, but here you can see just such a, a, a circumstance that happened in another patient. So here we go. Uh, this is, again, another history, another tumor presenting in a neonate. And the history is this patient required resuscitation with an umbilical venous catheter. And the catheter was vigorously advanced by the uh, neonatal resident, uh, probably traumatized the left atrial appendage. And here is a thrombus uh, coming out of the left atrial appendage uh, from trauma from a catheter. And here, lastly, to leave you with uh, some sobering thoughts is a patient who came from South America at 12 years of age, had had a neurological procedure a few weeks before, and uh, then had had a seizure, so got an echocardiogram, and here's the echocardiogram. And the question is, is this a tumor? What's the type specific? Is it a thrombus? Or because this patient had been in South America, perhaps uh, this was a a burrowing type of uh, tadpole that goes in and uh, matures within the right ventricle. And you can see it really does look like a, a tadpole. That's telling me I'm nearly finished, Dr. Hasbani. Um, and so we looked at this and this actually progressed in its size, which I think is important. And uh, we were very worried about this patient. Uh, we brought the patient to our own institution, repeated the echocardiogram, and here's this mass now. And so we prepared to take this patient uh, to uh, the operating room to remove the mass. But fortunately, a transesophageal echocardiogram was done before the chest was actually opened. And so this is the echocardiogram here. And I attribute my co to my colleague Dan Murphy for doing this. Um, being quite an obsessive gentleman, he was in the operating room very early and of course there was no tumor because it really was a thrombus that had completely resolved. So just a food for thought, thank you very much. Whoops. And now Dr. Shirali. Girish, we got a couple of little problems here. No. Oh, you're doing that, right, sorry, sorry. Just put this in here first. Don't do it there. Don't do it there. Always put it in here first because sometimes it sees that and then it won't see the machine. And you have your own, or you're going to present it on your power here. So. Okay. All right. Thanks. No hurry. All right. Thank you. 
Okay, good morning. All right, I'm going to I'm going to show you uh, uh, a few demonstrations of uh, 3D echocardiograms of uh, uh, cardiac tumors. Um, the first of these is a uh, is a rhabdomyoma. The second one is a rhabdomyoma. Then there's a fibroma, um, and a and a myxoma, and then uh, and then a, a, a right atrial sarcoma. All right. So so the first of these is a is a live 3D demonstration, and the the goals of um, 3D imaging uh, with this with in patients with tumors are to figure out um, uh, you know it, it really all has to do with the management implications. We don't just do these for getting pretty pictures. We want to figure out what what does this do for to the patient for the patient, and not just that, but um, if this is surgical disease, then what's the approach going to be? Um, you know, and, and what can the surgeon expect to find when they when they get in there? Okay, so so this is a this is a patient with multiple rhabdos, and um, uh, first thing I'm gonna I'm gonna be uh, doing here is uh, just sort of cleaning up the image a little bit, and then um, I'm gonna make this into a 2D image so that you understand what we're dealing with here more or less. Um, so. Everybody clear about that? So, parasternal long axis view, LA, LV, mitral valve looks fine. Uh, that doesn't look fine. And, and then there's that over there too. So, don't, don't miss that, but that's just a little interesting thing. This is far more interesting here. And the question here was, um, you know, for one thing, the involvement of the membranous septum. Uh, for another thing, Involvement of the right coronary cusp of the aortic valve, and then the third big question, of course, is what is this doing to the left ventricular outflow tract? Um, so when you look at it flat up like this, this is straight 2D echo, thin slice, and all of that. And then, um, and then as we kind of thicken this business up, things slowly start to start to kind of uh, develop a little more in terms of the depth. One of the things that you notice here. Notice what happens to that uh, uh, aortic valve cusp, the, this one here, the right coronary cusp of the aortic valve, right? And as we thicken that up, as we thicken the wedge up, you'll notice that this stays stuck over here. And uh, it wasn't until it wasn't until I really kind of talked about this with uh, with Bob Anderson and sort of understood the aortic valve that I realized that this is actually a normal structure here. These are the crowns of the semilunar uh, arterial uh, uh, semilunar attachments of the arterial valves. So that's that's normal. Um, you know, when we see aortic valve leaflets flipping um, by 2D echo, we just don't have this this depth perception. And uh, you know, and and it was it was certainly something that um, that, that that helped with that uh, as far as the understanding of that. Then the next thing I'm going to do here. Is um, is just sort of um, maybe uh, try to show you what the surgeon might see um, when they go in, and that's what they would see. So if the surgeon transects the aorta and looks down on the tumor, then they're going to see that. So this is the right coronary cusp of the aortic valve. You see the thing flipping in and out, right? I'm going to go out a little bit more, okay? So that's the right coronary cusp of the aortic valve. It's always the anterior one. Um, yeah, and that's the left and that's the non-coronary cusp. And then um, when you turn this, you, you realize that only that much of the LV outflow tract is actually open during systole. All of that big orange thing that you're seeing, the big circle there is all tumor occupying the um, LV outflow tract. So it's a pretty serious uh, amount of uh, pathology here. Now what if you wanted to look at that from inside the LV apex? So you could cut this off over here and look up at it. So now we're looking from the LV apex. It's almost like a parasternal short axis view, right? So although it's a long axis, you still get a short axis from it. That's the anterior mitral leaflet. It's actually the anterior surface of the anterior mitral leaflet, this thing. 
And then you can see the tumor moving during the cardiac cycle. You see that? And as it moves, you'll see this little semilunar thing that opens up. That. That little black thing there, that's the LV outflow tract. That little crescent of black. Watch. You making sense? So, so this, um, you know, so our surgeon actually um, uh, uh, went in and, uh, and took this business out. He was actually able to peel it away quite easily, he said, um, you know, from the um, aortic valve, uh, uh, from the right coronary cusp of the aortic valve. There was no AI in the end. This is, by the way, this is looking at the same thing from sort of from the, like an angiographer's um, what, what our angiographers might call a, a, a right anterior oblique kind of a projection. I'll just show you that before we move on to the next uh, example. Yeah, so this is like an RAO type of a projection over here. So that again is the right coronary cusp over there. That's the crown of the um, uh, attachment. So the concept, uh, we, I'm sure everyone's familiar with this concept of Bob Anderson's, that the arterial valves are not semilunar valves. It's the attachments of the leaflets that are semilunar. Um, and, you know, and they, they kind of go like this, right? And so what we're seeing up here is the top part of that. That's that business over there. Um, is there a gradient across the... Yeah, there was a gradient. Yeah, there was a gradient. How high? Like 50. Yeah, and this was a neonate. Uh, and we were very concerned about how, how this uh, outflow tract might behave if the baby were to get dry or, or God knows if the mom burped the baby aggressively or some, some crazy thing like that were to happen. Uh, the next one I'm going to show you is another neonate. This was sort of early on in our, um, in our experience with 3D, although not from 1970, as you might believe from looking at this picture here. Um, I have a program that, that, that actually anonymizes these pictures, and when it does that, it gives, uh, it gives all kinds of strange dates and things like that. So the patient's name and information goes away, and then the dates get replaced with 1170, which may have been the day that the programmer was born. I don't know, but anyway. So, so this is a parasternal short axis view of a, of a, of a right atrial um, rhabdomyoma. And, um, and, and what I'm going to kind of do with this is uh, I'm going to start by showing you like the equivalent of a 2D sweep of the, um, of the heart in a parasternal short axis view at the base. So this is the inferior vena cava coming up to the right atrium. This is the eustachian valve. More or less the plane of the atrial septum over here, the left atrium would be on this side, the tricuspid valve over here. You see a little bit of echo density over there. And then as you sort of do this sort of pretend sweep, if you will, you know, um, this, this mass sort of comes into view. So we're going up higher and higher. You see the aortic valve leaflets now over there. And then you see this mass uh, developing and so on and so forth. And so what, what we are going to do now with the, with the whole 3D business is figure out uh, what, this, what, this really kind of, uh, what this really looks like. And, um, and, and sort of that's what it looks like in the, on the side. And that's what it looks like from above. So this is the superior part of the right atrium. That's the plane of the atrial septum. There's a foramen over there, but we're not going to try to diagnose a foramen based on, you know, the thing is parallel to the transducer, so that's not going to help us very much. But you get a general sense of how this thing has two lobes to it. If you tilt down, you can see that the mouth of the IVC is quite preserved. It's not really occupied by the tumor, although it is a really large tumor uh, in, this, uh, in this neonate, All right? Um, yeah. Now, what we didn't do with 3D imaging here, but we did with 2D imaging on this baby, was um, we wanted to see what would happen to this tumor when the when the mom. So this sort of is attached to the. It's, a, it's the roof of the right atrium, right? It's the upper part of the right atrium where it's big. The the IVC part is is spared. What we were trying to figure out was what would happen to the mouth of the IVC, and so we scanned the baby um, as we lifted the baby up in the nursery. We just wanted to see what would happen to it. And it basically went, the, the tumor was, it wasn't going to go away anywhere, but it basically just occluded the mouth of the IVC. Um, it was a dynamic thing. When we tilt the baby back, it tilted back again. Then we just made the baby NPO and sent the baby off to the OR. 
I'm not telling you that that's a 3D thing. It was just an interesting thing that happened. Um, then the next uh, few examples I wanted to show you are from uh, uh, John Simpson uh, at Evelina. So uh, this is a uh, right atrial sarcoma. And uh, what, what, what John is doing here is he's using the 3D transducer to obtain uh, what we call X-plane imaging, OK? So what you do with X-plane imaging is you get this kind of a picture over here. So this is a paristone, this is an apical four-chamber view on a, on a sarcoma. Uh, all of that is sarcoma, of course. Um, so RA, RV, LA, LV. And what you're doing here is you, you drop your cursor over here. It's just regular live imaging with a 3D transducer. You press this button that's called X-plane, and it immediately gives you a view that is 90 degrees orthogonal to the view that you just got. And it displays both of them simultaneously. Now, um, this is obtained at a frame rate that is about half the frame rate of each of the 2D images. Okay? So this 2D image would have been a frame rate of 75, 76, something like that. Uh, when you get it in X-plane, you'll end up getting it at 38 frames per second. Um, it's not really playing very well here, but that's a function of the video on the machine. It's not a function of the, of the way the video, the logic of the video. But what, what this really helps us to understand is if you're, if you're in an apical four-chamber view at 3 o'clock looking at the heart, then this is, of course, this is right and left and sort of posterior superior and anterior inferior. But, but what, you're, what you're trying to also figure is what's happening more anteriorly and what's happening more posteriorly in the atrium. And this gives you a pretty good sense of that because you rotated your transducer into um, like an apical two-chamber type, type of a view. So it's like an apical four-chamber view at 6 o'clock. That's really what you're, what you're getting. So, so, so this, this ends up being far more anterior, and that ends up being far more posterior. Okay? So this is actually um, a good, um, good, good uh, sort of a tool for, um, for that. Uh, John also showed me this, uh, this picture that he has of a left atrial myxoma. It's interesting. I don't think that it particularly adds a whole lot. This is, a, this is one of our patients with a, with a left ventricular fibroma. And this is, again, a very sort of a unusual echo cut. It's a it's sort of a right anterior oblique kind of a cut. So if you get a parasternal long axis view and you turn it around, that's what this would look like. So the LA is here. The mitral valve is here. The left ventricular cavity is there and the um, aortic um, valve is over there, and so on. It's the same cut that I showed you earlier. So there's a mitral valve over there. All of this is tumor. So sometimes these tumors, the fibromas, can be quite um, homogeneous, and they can be very, very difficult to tease out from the rest of the myocardium and that kind of thing. So you can see normal myocardium over there and uh, the fibroma um, over here. When you have something like this, that is this diffuse and large, uh, it becomes very difficult to, to, think about, uh, to think about resecting it and so on. So that's, uh, that's all I have. So um, I'd like to uh, especially thank Rebecca um, Brokenheim from Boston Children's Hospital who provided me with um, many of these slides and uh, images. Um, she really wrote the paper um, that explained cardiac tumors in children with cardiac MRI. And so um, a lot of the images are from her paper. I'm going to um, show you guys an overview of cardiac tumors in children show you how uh, cardiac MRI can help differentiate um, the pathology prior to, obviously, performing 
um, a TE in the OR, as Dr. Silverman stated, and, um, and then go through about approximately eight cases. So cardiac tumors in children, I think many of you guys know, rhabdomyoma is sort of the top, most common one, and then there's um, a slew of different ones at, um, uh, with uh, fibroma and myxoma being kind of the top one's uh, way further down than the rhabdomyoma. Um, but obviously when they're present, they can cause a lot of injury to um, the vascular system and the areas around it. So just to re review, rhabdomyoma is usually from muscle tissue. Fibroma is a fibrous. Hemangioma can be vascular. Lipoma is fat. Teratoma can be ec um, ectopic. And then malignant are obviously of various different tissues. And the reason this is important is because um, cardiac MR can do tissue differentiation depending on what type of tissue it is. And so it can help with both the tumor location and the tissue characterization. So uh, the study with, uh, by uh, Dr. Bergheim was a multi-center study where she collected images from um, 78 um, different tumors with histology. And then uh, the CMR was reviewed, the cardiac MR was reviewed. The diagnosis was correct in 97% of the tumors. Differential diagnosis was um, correct in 42%, and there was two incorrect diagnoses. When a, a complete CMR exam was performed, a more accurate diagnosis was present. So what was performed, there was the CINE SSFP. Those are the CINE images I've been showing you guys. They also did something called the T1 weighted image or double inversion recovery. This looks to see if there's a potential fat in the tissue. A T2 weighted image, which also looks to see if there's potential fat in the tissue. A first pass perfusion, that's where I've shown you guys where a contrast enters into the actual um, blood pool and we watch to see what happens. And then the um, gadolinium delayed enhancement, myocardial delayed enhancement. And so depending on what tissue you have, you've got different um, characteristics of the tissue. And I've put in green some of the um, spots where this is unique to only one type of tissue. Um, there's other variabilities that can be seen. But I will show you guys several of examples of all of these. And so it will help kind of differentiate how cardiac MR can show you guys the different tissue modalities. So this first one is a six-year-old boy with white complex tachycardia. 16 hours after his cardioversion, he had left-sided facial weakness, and an echocardiogram was performed, and then a cardiac MRI, and you can see right away that there's a pretty large mass here at the edge of the myocardium. So you got the cine. You also have the T1-weighted image. The tissue all looks the same here. And then you have your first pass perfusion where gadolinium is given and then it's, let me show that again. Gadolinium is given and you can watch to see what happens as it enters into the tumor and whether the tumor lights up or not. You can also see T2 and here it's a little bit darker than the um, tissue surrounding it. But late gadolinium enhancement, you can see it's quite a bit enhanced and so there's quite a bit of gadolinium that's remained there. And that's the fibro, fibroma that you see. Um, the first pass perfusion did not light up. There was no fat saturation with the T1 and T2 images. And here's some more examples of fibromas. And so they almost always light up in late gadolinium enhancement. You can see different locations, but they all have that white enhancement. Another example is a 13-year-old girl was asymptomatic. A murmur was noted on an evaluation for a sport uh, physical. And you can see that there's something right here in the right atrium. You can see it here as well. And a little black dot, they uh, attempted to take her to the cath lab and coil this, what seemed to appear to them to be a vascular mass. Then you see the first pass perfusion. It lights up very nicely. 
which is why they thought it was a vascular mass. Play through. And it was an um, intramuscular hemangioma that was actually uh, thinned walled and quite um, uh, vascular. Repeat uh, MRI showed that the mass was um, no longer there. However, she presented five years later, and you see that the mass is once again present, and you notice by echo that you can see that it's vascular with um, blood flow in the mass. An MRI was performed again, and once again you can see in first pass perfusion that it lights up quite a bit with uh, the gadolinium enhancement. So here you see dark, and then as the contrast enters the coronary arteries, you can see the, that it lights up. Um, some uh, lighting up all around on the enhancement on the outside, and delayed enhancement was positive. So a vascular tumor with first pass perfusion being positive, which makes sense with a vascular tumor, Variable delayed enhancement, in our case it was positive, no fat that was noted in it, and so it was an intramuscular hemangioma of mixed vessels. No concerns for malignancy, but there is a high rate of recurrence. So in this patient, five years later, she did have a recurrency. Vascular tumors, like hemangiomas, tend to have um, uh, different vascular malformations. They could um, have a strong vascular supply, which is why they enhance by um, uh, first perfusion and can also have uh, malignant vascular tumors as part of them. Next case is a 16-year-old male, asymptomatic, with an incidental finding. You can see right here between the aorta and the main pulmonary artery, there's a mass that's present by echo. Um, uh, Ectopy and arrhythmia were noted postoperatively. So you can see the mass right here, as well as right here. Um, by T1 and T2, there seems to not be significant abnormalities. It is enhanced by T2, and delayed enhancement is not enhanced. The tissue stays uh, dark throughout that. By first pass perfusion, you can see that there is definitely vascular um, abnormalities here with it receiving contrast pretty early on. And then by coronary and geography, you can see the vascular nature of the mass as well. And so once again, a very vascular mass was noted. And this is actually a paraganglioma that they found, was removed. It was a succinate dehydrogenous B mutation. Uh, this is another case, pretty common one to see, fetal, pretty large tumor. You can see again by MRI, tissue remains the same in T1 and T2. Uh, first pass perfusion did not light up, and delayed enhancement did not light up. So no enhancement on first pass perfusion. And this was a uh, large rhabdomyoma in a fetal patient that was noted also after birth. This is another example of a rhabdomyoma. You can see the small little. This is a three week old female with respiratory distress. Also had an echo. Notice a large mass here. And you can see that this looks very different than the rhabdomyoma we just saw. It's um, heterogeneous with quite a few different, uh, what appears to be different structures in it. 
if you look, there's uh, definitely still the heterogeneity that's noted oh. in all of these. No fat sets specifically. First pass perfusion remained dark, did not light up, and so this was a teratoma. Here are a couple of other examples of teratoma versus hemangiomas. You can see uh, the heterogeneity that's present in the teratomas versus the hemangiomas, which uh, light up in uh, first pass perfusion and in late gadolinium enhancement. So teratomas don't tend to have a vascular nature to them versus the hemangiomas that are vascular. Next case is a 16-year-old asymptomatic female with an apical RV mass noted on echo. So you can see by MRI, there's a mass right there. You see it right here at the apex of the right ventricle. During first pass perfusion, it remains dark. T1, it lights up, being white. And then with T1 fat saturation, it becomes black. And so you can see that this is very much positive with T1, but fat saturation was positive as well, making it a lipoma. Next case is an asymptomatic female, no arrhythmias. LV tumor was an incidental finding um, and had a seven-year follow-up with CMR. You can see that the small tumor has gotten to be a little bit bigger. You can see here by delayed enhancement that it gets brighter. And so this was another fibroma that was noted. You can see by first pass perfusion that this does not light up, but delayed enhancement does make it light up. Um, and so this other one may have been a vascular tissue. <coughs> a 19-year-old female, history of metastatic rhabdomyosarcoma, a new onset of chest pain, and a pericardial effusion. You can see by CINE that there's a mass here, by T1 as well. T2, it looks a little brighter. First pass perfusion remains dark, and delayed enhancement seems dark as well. And so this was a malignant tumor, which can act very similar to whatever um, cell it comes from. So depending on whether it's a lung metastasis or um, other differences, and depending on its vascular capabilities, it's going to be positive or negative for um, first-pass perfusion and delayed enhancement. So just as a summary, cardiac tumors arise from a variety of tissue types. Cardiac MR can allow to help with uh, tissue typing in many different cases and um, differentiation of the tumors with the vascular uh, supply uh, and differentiation with uh, malignancy can help before they go to the operating room. <coughs>
associated with the capillary muscles. And uh, the problem with golf balls is that when they multiple, there's a much and moody, there's a much higher pricing associated with them. And that's what the fear is about. And that's what Beryl Benatra originally wrote about the so-called difficult process. Actually, most of them are totally benign, especially when they single or even when they buy a double in the left atrium, in, in the left ventricle. They arise in the region where the fibrous tissue is attached to the muscle. And fibrous tissue is one of the densest tissue, so it makes very bright ultrasound pictures. Okay? And uh, it's a normal phenomenon. Okay? It's just a question of how good your ultrasound is. So really the bottom line is unless you're doing first trimester ultrasound, the appearance of single or even two uh, golf balls is of no significance. But when there are multiple golf balls, there's a much higher incidence of pricing and that's what the risk is and that's what the concern is. But when you see them in an in a, in a 18 to 20 week scan, uh, almost all of them are uh, of the line. And in fact, the American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine has now declassified uh, echogenic foci as being of any significance at all. So there's just a tiny little suspicion, and uh, I think uh, there's no re reason to find one or two to worry about. No constitution of that in the No, not at all. from the maternal bloodstream and you can then uh, phenotype uh, the, the, the fetus on the basis of these cells that are, are growing out of maternal blood. So I think it's getting uh, uh, easier to, to relieve people's tension about this. You don't have to expose the fetus to the risk of death because of a, a, an amniocentesis and so on and so forth. But I think if it's negative, if pricing in 21 is negative, I send them back to the see babies like this, they, it disappears. A, a, the golf ball is a phenomenon of fibrous tissue on muscle. And fibrous tissue on muscle makes a bright echo. And uh, it's a normal phenomenon. If you examine the normal papillary muscle, where the tendinous cords are attached with the muscle of the, of the papillary muscle, uh, it, there is a bright area that's a reflective uh, issue, and it's, it's a normal phenomenon. And you don't follow up them after birth? The I time never do that. Yeah. I never do that. The only time I follow them up is when the lawyer sends me a lawsuit because the baby's got trisomy. But so far that hasn't happened. So question, can a fibroma masquerade in a uh, asymmetric interventricular septal hypertrophy? I've not seen it. With a positive sound? Uh, no, I've not seen it. The only, the only question, the only doubt that this is not hope is the brightness of the interventricular septum. And no family history of hope. That's, that doesn't scare me. I mean, there are many causes of hypertrophic myopathy. It's 17, 17 millimeters. Yeah. In what I, the first thing I have to ask is what is the sugar status of the mother? Is the mother diabetic? Mm -hmm. Okay, and is there any neurological disease? No. no. But I don't think that that's a, 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 a far problem. Uh, 
ma non ti interessa il nostro. Su un certo sito. Ma ti hai fatto fare il bagno. Yeah. Interpreto tu che sei stato molto bravo. Yeah. Bright is one thing, but uh, you know, a fibromas they tend to enlarge and uh, they do assume a more spherical shape. I've never seen that. What I have seen is I've seen uh, the rhabdomyomas do that sort of thing, involve the septum like that. All the septum without seeing any significant. Yeah. Well, you just turned on the. As Barney showed a picture of the whole septum being involved and then the mass grows uh, down towards the lateral wall and becomes a. Um, sort of like a dumbbell shape. Yeah. So um, here's a question, Dr. Asmani. Uh, would you think that if you see a fetus or a neonate with multiple tumors that the, and they have the characteristic appearance of a tuberous sclerosis and even uh, if there's uh, any evidence that an MRI is indicated in that patient? I mean, I think if there's, if there's a thought of tuberous sclerosis, you know, there's other patients are going to probably go to the MRI suite anyway for a brain MRI. Yeah. You can always do yeah. a short so portion of the... You, you weren't here when Dr. Sanders talked about it, but um, um, certainly I know in our institution and uh, at the University of California is that fetal MRI can, can find subependable rhabdomyomas uh, or tamatomas, the tubers, in the, in the fetus. Okay, so you're saying if you go into the suite to look for the, uh, the brain, you might as well get the heart as a bonus. Okay, that's a good answer. Excellent. All right, are there any other questions about tumors? No? All right. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I have a, a mystery case that I'd like to get people's opinions on. It's nothing relating to tumors, but since we have seven minutes, we can get... Well, of course you can. Okay, so this is a, a uh, this patient is a 23 year old special ops soldier. Special ops are the kind of people that went after bin Laden, just by the way. They're very, very tough and they're very in great shape. He was stationed overseas, he couldn't tell us anything more about where he was stationed. He ran 10 kilometers a day, had no problem with any physical activity. And while he was out in the field somewhere, uh, he, had some, he had sudden, non-recurring, sharp chest pain. He was reading a book, he said, and they had this chest pain. So they took him to the, the field ED, so in the, uh, wherever he was, and they found that his oxygen saturation was 85%. But other than that, he looked great. He was not in any distress. He looked fine. Uh, his sats did not respond to oxygen. Okay. So he was on the, in the field with the adult people taking a look at him. So they did a CT on him. The CT was, you know, didn't show any pulmonary embolus. They did a cath on him. His coronaries were fine. He's 23 years old, all right? They, they took him off active duty, told him to go back to the U.S. and put him on some desk job. So he stayed on his desk job, and he had to see a doctor every month. His saturations were steady 85% the whole time. And finally, the, uh, the cardiologist that were taking care of him sent him to see us in our clinic. All right. Completely unremarkable exam. Tough, terrific, you know, he, his body fat must have been about 3 or 4%. He looked great, but his SAT was 85%. He couldn't change it. Technically difficult echo, 95 kilos. So uh, that's a subcostal uh, long axis view. I'm just going to go over the salient parts because uh, 
you know, I could show you a 25-minute normal echo, but I think most of you have seen the normal echo, um, what, what normal echoes look like. I'm just pointing out to you that we actually tried and that my lab actually does do 2D echoes as well as 3D echoes. So this is this four-chamber view. You see the, uh, any comments from anybody? Right ventricle is very squeezed, okay. Um, then we thought, okay, well, is there a coronary sinus? So we focused in on that. There is a coronary sinus. Parasternal long axis view. Feel free to make any comments that you can come up with. Yeah, that was just a little IV something or the other that was going on. Parastinal short axis view. Off axis parastinal short, trying to show the atrial septum because the subcostals were very difficult and the off axis parastinal short is sometimes useful for that. Couldn't see anything there. Suprasternal notch, looking at for the innominate vein and the aortic arch. Left arch normal branching. Looking for an LSVC, scale is down to 23, which is very appropriate when you're looking for an LSVC. Shows no LSVC. And then uh, this is a look at the right SVC. There is one. It's good size. So what do you think? 85%. Is, it, is he have it standing or lying? Say, it doesn't change. No, it's just, it's just straight. No problems. What, would you, what do you want to do next? Sorry. What tests? Lung tests. Lung tests? Yeah, they're all completely normal. Completely normal. Contrast. So where do you want to give contrast? Well, if you would give it on the lunar side, then if you would have pulmonary or intrapulmonary AV fistulas, you have contrast. Okay. So where do you want to put in? Is your patient, where do you want to put in your IV? Wherever on the hand. Hand? Right hand or left hand? Why is he saying left hand? Left superior vena cava to unroofed coronary sinus, something like that, or LSVC to LA, right? Is that reasonable? Sound good yeah. to everybody? Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay. All right. And that's what you did, right? Sure, because you, I knew you were going to be here. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay. So contrast fills up the left heart. Look closely now. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's not like a, a, an unroofed coronary sinus, that's for sure. Why? Because when you see an unroofed coronary sinus, which I showed, yeah. it usually starts in the coronary sinus, and yeah. then you see the septal. Yeah, pulmonary. yeah. Whereas this one looks like it's actually coming from the right pulmonary veins. Yeah, everybody got that? Yeah. So the idea would be, uh, you, yeah, you, you know, this thing is coming from here. The picture that Norm had shown, it came from kind of here, here, wherever, you know, depends on where it got unroofed, that kind of thing. Everybody good with this so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, so do we have a diagnosis? Does the patient have an LSVC to the left atrium? We don't really have a diagnosis yet, right? We want to do anything else? Let's have a look at the SVC RA junction here and see whether there's a SVC RA junction, but you know, we've... We, I mean, we fight with the army we've got. We've got bubbles, so we're going to... Okay, so what do you want to do now? If they're pulmonary AVMs, why is it not filling the right heart? Did you do a bubble gram in the right side? Are you sure you want to do a That's on the right, the left arm, or is that the right arm? The first one was the left arm. I'm giving you right arm now. the right arm, thank you. I'm just predicting your question and giving you the answer. In the right arm, okay? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, so, so contrast in the IVC was also done, and that filled up only the right heart. Okay, you, don't, you have to take my word for that. Here's his angiogram. This is from like the year 2002 or something. What are you seeing? So his RSVC, he has only an RSVC, there's no LSVC. It goes to the left atrium, 
And what else are you seeing? That's the yeah. The right pulmonary veins are going to the SVC in a manner that is reminiscent of a sinus venosus ASD, except that there is no ASD. So this is uh, something that Bob Anderson uh, uh, really very much uh, enjoyed, this concept of uh, you can have all of this, but without an ASD, you see? It's tremendous, right? Yes, yeah. No, you have a, a, a SVC, RSVC, you have an SVC to the left atrium, right pulmonary veins to the SVC to the left atrium. So the pulmonary veins are all coming back to the left atrium, but so is the SVC flow. So the patient has an obligate right to left shunt that cannot be changed. You can't do anything about it. So the only way to fix this is going to be... You have to cut the, the, yeah, you have to cut the SVC here, yeah. up here, and so attach it to the... the yeah. 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 Sort of a warden procedure. Yeah. That's really what the warden procedure is. Well, I don't know how many minutes are left, but seeing we're talking about tumours and trying to make this appropriate for tumours, uh, let me just ask the group for some help uh, on, on, on a patient because um, I've actually sent this patient to uh, a group of surgeons. The history on this patient is this patient had a right atrial mass seen as a neonate, okay, uh, a, 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 as a fetus, and it persisted as a neonate. The child is entirely asymptomatic, entirely asymptomatic. Uh, they have not, there's not been an MRI, and the doctor has done a repeat echocardiogram on this patient and has shown a slight diminution in the size of this right atrial mass. So just let me just show you, oh, I did the wrong thing. Here we go. Let's just uh, try this. Here's the mass. Okay, if you didn't like that picture, I have others. There's a short axis picture. With color flow going all the way around. Uh, and a four chamber view. And subcostal view. So now I've shown you everything on this patient. What what do you recommend? This is a patient that comes from a rural, a different state in the United States, a little north of California. I don't want to give anything away. Um, uh, what what do you do for this patient? The, the tumor is stable in size, whatever the let's call it a mass, is stable in size. It's been present from fetal life. What else do you need to do? Dr. Esbani, what would you do? I, I recommended that in this patient. It has not been done yet. What else? Was this a surgical case or not? The child's entirely asymptomatic. Mark? Seven months. Seven months. So just get an MRI, that's it. Huh? What do you think it's likely to be? Yeah, could be a hemangioma, it could be a malignant hemangioma. It could be a rhabdo. You showed us a, a rhabdo very similar to that. And it also might be malignant, although it's going the wrong direction for a malignant tumor. I've, I've seen two echoes on this patient. So, I mean, I think it's very easy when you have got the histology in your hand and uh, the retrospectroscope, it's very easy to see these things. But if you um, don't have that, it's a, somewhat of a problem. So this patient is going to get an MRI and then we'll see what, uh, what happens. Thank you. All right, we'll move on now to the discussion of Epstein's malformation, hopefully. And uh, we're going to kick...